today's speaker is not my brother. <laughs> but he is my friend, and I'm pleased to introduce Professor Emeritus Albert Furtwängler. If that name sounds familiar, you probably remember that his wife, Ginny Furtwängler, spoke to us spring term. Albert has a BA from Amherst and a PhD from Cornell. He taught at the University of Chicago and Linfield College, but his longest stint was at Mount Allison University in New Brunswick. That's um, one of the three maritime provinces of Canada, and it's about as far from his hometown of Seattle that you can get without stepping into the Atlantic Ocean. There he taught 18th century American and English literature. However, his research focused on the history of the American West and led to five books and countless articles examining the explorers, settlers, and indigenous peoples of the American West. Thus, you will not be shocked to know that his subject this morning includes Lewis and Clark, but how they're connected <clears throat> to the Voyager project, we'll just have to wait to listen to his talk. My source tells me that Al has an unusual incubation stage of writing. Rather than different from the way we teach our students, which is gather all your information, state your thesis, make the outline, support your arguments, conclude. Only then do you begin writing. Well, I understand that Al goes to a comfortable chair, no laptop or paper in view, and then he just thinks. After many such sessions, he will start to write, or he might go back to that chair and think some more. I don't know how anybody does that with all this stuff hitting your brain that isn't the subject. Al has other talents. He plays the banjo, honoring, or honing his skills with biweekly trips to Portland for lessons. He also collects old, beautiful stamps but they never go in albums. They go on old, beautiful postcards sent to friends, inviting them to an event, or just saying hello. Jenny and he are besotted with the Wagner ring cycle, which they have roamed the world to hear many times. Finally, they subscribe to both Seattle and Portland symphonies, but I suspect they might give away those tickets if the same night Pink Martini is in town. <laughs> Please welcome Alfred Al or, to the podium. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, well, uh, there are uh, I don't know quite how to come on after that <laughs> introduction. Um, I promised in the uh, description that I gave you for the, for the talk that I would do two things. I would uh, talk about Lewis and Clark, and I would also talk about the uh, uh, Voyager space probe. And I don't, I'm not, uh, quite sure how I can justify, uh, if you have technical questions about the space program, I'm not really expert on that. Uh, for Lewis and Clark, I can rely, as, as the introducer said, to about 30 years of experience of studying Lewis and Clark and writing about them. Uh, but that's such a massive topic that it too can uh, slip into detail about uh, all sorts of things. That's why it remains perpetually fascinating. About the Voyager uh, expedition, I'm going to rely on an excellent book by Stephen J. Pine uh, called Voyager. Um, and Pine uh, 
uh, has written many books about uh, scientific subjects. Uh, he's a professor at uh, Arizona State University. And uh, he did a very thorough study of, of uh, Voyager, but he also used it as a, uh, a way into discussing other things. Now, what I can do is uh, hold two things up and compare them. Uh, that's what I've done as a, as a teacher for many years of literature. You take, let's say, a sonnet of Shakespeare's and you put it next to the uh, next adjacent sonnet and sometimes one thing lights up in one and sometimes one thing lights up in another. If you take Hamlet, uh, Shakespeare's play, and you set it over against Oedipus Rex, uh, the play by Sophocles, you begin to see that Hamlet had, a, had an Oedipus complex. Uh, and that's the way uh, some theater producers have done it. If you set it up against the Oresteia in which uh, uh, Orestes seeks justice, then you've got a different kind of perspective on the play. But it's by putting one thing against another that you begin to see things. And Pine himself began to, to, to uh, look at exploration, the whole idea of exploration, um, and used uh, the Voyager uh, space probe uh, to look back at what he called three great ages of world exploration, exploration and beyond. The first is the exploration from, uh, of the sea. The voyages that began out of Portugal down the African coast into the Atlantic, eventually across the Atlantic, and eventually around the world. Magellan's voyage he calls the, la the grand gesture, the grand gesture of that first great age of exploration. The second great age of exploration, he claims, was the movement across continents the exploration of the interior of before unknown continents. And this too originates with European explorers and goes into uh, mainly the Americas. And he says the great gesture there was about simultaneous. It happened in two prongs. Alexander von Humboldt crossed uh, the continent of South America making close observations of uh, plants, animals, topography, minerals, all sorts of things. He came back just about the time that Lewis and Clark crossed the American continent, from, in Lewis's case, from sea to sea. So he sees Lewis and Clark, fortunately for my topic, as the second great gesture, the great gesture of the second great age of exploration. The third great age of exploration is the movement into outer space. And the great gesture there began in 1977 with the launching of two uh, rockets carrying uh, instrument uh, probes that would reach all the outer planets of the solar system, from Jupiter to, uh, to, to Saturn to Uranus to, uh, let's see, Neptune, and even to Pluto, and beyond. And in fact, the, the Voyager 1 has now exited the complete solar system. So we've put into really outer space one probe uh, in history. So that's the great, he sometimes calls it the grand tour that was made of the outer solar system after other uh, ships had, had reached uh, Mercury and Venus and, and Mars in, in earlier exploration. Pine also talks about what motivated and still motivates people to do that kind of exploration. And again, he has a kind of three-tier pattern that he uses. First of all, there was the desire for human settlement, for expansion of human control over the environment, and, and for moving out to claim new lands and territories, or new sea lanes, or domination. You might say domination over things. It has its military aspect. 
It has its colonial aspect. You can, you can fill in the blanks on that. The second <clears throat> is the advancement of science, the pure um, desire to learn, just learn about new plants, new animals, new peoples, new territories. Uh, <laughs> not just as a tourist, but to uh, bring into the knowledge of the world uh, new things that might uh, illuminate the things we're most familiar with and give us a better control uh, over our uh, understanding of our place in the universe. The third, he says, and this is, uh, I think, rather new to him, is a sense that in America, certainly, but from the European standpoint as well, there was an impulse just to keep on going. Maybe something, he says, even in our genetic character, but certainly in our cultural character as Americans, we got here from Europe, now let's keep going. It's built in, it's an American impulse to keep searching, keep going further and further into the world or into the universe. Let's begin, uh, let me see if I can make this work. That one, go back one. Uh, hmm? There we go. There we go. And then no, I can use it. Just press forward on there. No, I just want to use the, oh, you want the, the pointer. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, I would like to retrace the Lewis and Clark uh, route for you on this map. <laughs> I don't really imagine that all of you went home over the weekend and prepared for this talk, <laughs> reading the Lewis and Clark journal. So I'll review to the point that, that Lewis himself was a, uh, uh, can you hear me? No, no. Okay. Lewis was a, uh, a private secretary to Thomas Jefferson, whom Jefferson chose to do this. So he began at Monticello, right there, went to Washington, D.C. From there, Jefferson sent him to Philadelphia to train, to prepare, uh, to le learn how to use astronomical instruments to determine longitude and latitude, to gather further information about w what kinds of uh, records he should keep of what he found and, and bring back uh, proper specimens and bring back proper uh, descriptions of plants, animals, and so on. Meanwhile, he was ordering supplies From Philadelphia, he went back and across to Pittsburgh. There he had a keel boat built. It de its delay slowed him up for a time, but he also had uh, a crew for the keel boat and two or three, there's some uh, ambiguity about that, young men on probation who might come with him. From there, he was now on the Ohio River. So he could use the Ohio River to get down to, uh, in between here, to uh, uh, <laughs> Louisville, Louisville, Kentucky. Louisville is across from Clarksville and that's where William Clark was, was uh, staying with his older brother, George Rogers Clark. So now you might say this is where, you, you, it's, it's always ambiguous, where did the Lewis and Clark expedition begin? You remember uh, if you were here last week, uh, uh, Tom Marsh's talk about the Oregon Trail, and he said, you know, when people got on the Oregon Trail, they, they first had to get a long way just to get to the start of the Oregon Trail. Well, so did Lewis. So he was, he was getting this boat 
to St. Louis, uh, but he had to, to meet up with Clark and, and, and get to there first. Now, <clears throat> following the, uh, this keeps doing the wrong thing for me. Uh, oh, I should use this other thing for that, I suppose. Hmm? There we go. You can, you can see this well enough, maybe I don't need to point. Is that going to work OK? Yeah, OK. From uh, St. Louis, uh, from, uh, from uh, Louisville, William Clark had already picked up nine young men of Kentucky, as they're often called, who were uh, good woodsmen and uh, m military uh, recruits and could be disciplined to do this. So they're starting to big, build a staff. When he gets down to uh, the, the intersection of the Ohio River uh, with the uh, uh, Mississippi, he, he picks up another uh, excellent uh, member of the, as an interpreter and uh, guide, uh, George Druyer. They go on up to, to uh, St. Louis. Now, as you may recall, Thomas Jefferson had by this point uh, with the, by a surprise, negotiated the Louisiana Purchase. Louisiana, uh, everything west of the Mississippi, was held by the Spanish. And there were Spanish military officers in St. Louis. And they did not want American military moving into their territory. Uh, so until the spring of 1804, uh, Lewis and Clark had to camp on the other side, on the eastern side of the Mississippi River at what's called Fort Du Bois. But that was a good opportunity for them to build, bring all their recruits together, train them, and begin to observe whether they were uh, fit to go on this trip and, and really survive uh, uh, the, the rigors of the travel and uh, also uh, uh, keep good discipline. It was also a chance for Lewis to go into St. Louis and confer with fur traders who'd gone up the Missouri River quite a distance and see whether uh, he could find out uh, good information about how, what lay ahead and also store in the kinds of supplies and trade goods that he would need. From there, in the spring of 183, they began to, 184, they began to move up the river to, the, to North Dakota. Now they pushed against the current. They had waited until the spring to avoid uh, heavy flooding on the Missouri. They got up to the, uh, to the uh, uh, moving upstream, they got to the, what's now North Dakota in time to camp with the Mandan Indians there, Mandan Indian villages. There were fur traders from the north, the, uh, from uh, British companies, that were there, and they picked up two important uh, further members of the expedition. We all know about Sacago Wea, who was the uh, wife uh, or woman of uh, to Saint Charbonneau. Charbonneau was uh, an, uh, said he was an interpreter, and that his wife had lived in that area before, so he could interpret uh, from her to uh, he could speak her with her, he could speak in French to another member of the group, he could <laughs> then have that translated into English, and uh, sometimes it was a pretty long chain of uh, engagements. Finally, they set off, and here's where the Lewis and Clark deep expedition begins, because no one had yet traversed the Rocky Mountains to the west coast uh, across this part of North America. There had been an earlier expedition further north by a Canadian named Alexander Mackenzie. They were, according to Jefferson's instructions, to trace the course of the Missouri River to its source, and from there make an easy portage across a low mountain range. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. They were imagining that they were doing something like going across the Alleghenies. Uh, 
Lewis carried even a portable boat. He had this metal frame, this iron framework that he could uh, attach skins to and caulk, and they thought that they would use that and float down the Columbia. Well, as you know, they reached the, uh, what we now call the Great Falls of the Missouri, and they spent about a month there just trying to get around the Great Falls and set up some way of going further. When they got to the, uh, as one of the Lewis and Clark uh, experts in the field once put it, they spent a considerable time in a, in a stage of the journey called, where the hell am I? But eventually, they ran into uh, uh, Sacagawea's people who had horses and had a guide who would take them across the Rockies as winter was setting in. So they made it half starved to the west side of the Rockies in Idaho, were met there and welcomed by Nez Perce people who helped them along. Eventually, they built new canoes came down the Columbia, went over difficult falls and passages through the Columbia, got to uh, what we now call Astoria, and had the most miserable winter of their lives. Now, I'll stop there and just say they, in the course of doing all this, gathered all sorts of information. It's quite incredible that they picked up not only geographical information, but botanical information, zoological information, mineralogical information. They were army officers, but they picked up a, an awful lot of uh, very good uh, exploratory information about this new continent. <clears throat> that was one of their achievements. Another of the achievements is that they came back intact if you were here at the talk a week ago about all the rigors of the Oregon Trail and how many people perished of disease and of the hardships of that crossing, Lewis and Clark lost only one man and he seems to have had an internal problem like appendicitis or uh, some other kind of immediate problem that couldn't have been dealt with uh, even back home. That's an incredible feat of discipline and good order that they brought to this expedition. So they came back safely. They brought a wealth of information. And they were the first Americans to inhabit this whole new territory that we think of as uh, the West. They dwelt through a winter in North Dakota, through another winter in Oregon. and. By doing this, they laid claim to the uh, new Louisiana Territory, but they also seconded the claim of uh, Robert Gray to the whole drainage of the Columbia River. And this was important in acquiring for the United States this, northern, this whole northern tier of, uh, of uh, North America. Here is the uh, Voyageur map of where they went. They too had preparatory conditions, just as Lewis and Clark had had, particularly Lewis, to prepare for this. This couldn't have happened probably unless there had been Cold War rivalries between the United States and Russia after Sputnik. That really concentrated the minds of politicians and scientists on getting the American rockets as far into space as they could. <clears throat> Along with that was the post-war development of sophisticated rocketry and uh, computers and other kinds of uh, technological equipment that could, that could make an exploration possible. Third, there was public support in the 50s and the early 60s for uh, developing a major kind of what we might call in the terms of, Henry James, uh, of William James, a moral equivalent to war. Doing something just as disciplined, just as uh, demanding on people, but uh, 
in a way that wasn't uh, uh, murderous and violent. So there was this uh, Cold War rivalry which uh, enabled the scientists to uh, uh, petition for money and get it to put this together. And there was also the technical, technological know-how that enabled them to do it. Even so, there was no rocket science, no rocket capacity to really lift off a major rocket and get it way out into outer space. It was just technologically impossible with the, with the kinds of thrust that, that even Werner von Braun could, could put together. But in 1961, a mathematical graduate student working for NASA or for the Jet Propulsion Laboratory came up with a discovery. He projected that if you put a ship out into outer space and it went to one of these larger planets and moved around it, the gravitational force of that planet would accelerate the speed of the, of the rocket. It would give it a boost, a boost. And if you went to another one, it would give you another boost. And, and so they could get to a higher rate of travel than anybody had ever thought of by rocket fuel alone. In 1965, there was another discovery. That was that once every 176 years, the planets would be aligned so that you could make one smooth shot and hit each of the outer planets in order. And the next time was going to be 1977. After that, it was going to be 2156. You had just this little window of time and just this little opportunity to do something not yet known. It was projected mathematically, get into the orbits of these planets and give a boost to get out to each of those planets in time to make observations. So with <laughs> multi-million dollars of investment and a huge, huge uh, involvement of technicians, they developed this little probe and got rockets together and launched them. In August and September of 1977, they launched two, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2. Almost two years later, they reached Jupiter. 5th of March, 79, and 9th of July, 79. A year later, they reached Saturn. In 86, they reached Uranus. You know, that name is just impossible. <laughs> you can't say Uranus, and you can't say Uranus without, you know, don't teach it in fourth grade. In May of 89, they reached Neptune, <clears throat> or, the, or Voyager 1 did, and then moved on, uh, uh, Voyager 2 did, and then moved, uh, both of them have moved now out to the limits of the solar system. What were their accomplishments? Just as Lewis and Clark came back with everyone intact, these two probes <clears throat> proved that you could uh, survive in an unknown environment. They went out, they sent back tons of information, and they survived all that time. <clears throat> they also did it with fine precision. Pine says that there was a 100 kilometer uh, uh, what was it called? Delivery error. The going, how did, you, how did you put it here? The project was promised, uh, uh, premised on the ability, as the prevailing metaphor put it, to tee up a golf ball in New York and sink a hole in one in California. <laughs> and they did it. It brought out stunning revelations of what these planets were like. 
They were just fuzzy to astronomers at that time. But we got close-up photography uh, and other kinds of instrumentation uh, to pick up magnetic fields and other kinds of min uh, uh, do testing of the kinds of composition that were in these things. They also saw in very s brief uh, pass-bys, just matters of hours, uh, what their moons were like, how many moons there were, uh, what they were, each one of them turned out to be a revelation because each moon was different from every other. And they came back <clears throat> with a negative result, just as Lewis and Clark had made a negative result that there were a heck of a lot of big mountains out there blocking the way, the Voyager spacecraft came back uh, with the negative results that there was absolutely no sign of life or the material for life. That the notion of going out and settling on another planet in the far reaches of the solar system was going to be impossible. Well, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity and the American scientists and, and engineers of NASA and the Jet Propulsion Laboratory achieved it. By the way, they had to do it for uh, so many years that, that uh, as you can see, this was a, a multi-year project and staff would, would have to, you know, some people said, well, you could have a career in science. You could have a career just following this, <laughs> this one probe. Now, a couple of years ago, the, uh, the uh, New York Times Magazine had a feature on how uh, the engineers that are still operating, that were still operating this thing were about to retire and training new people to come into a little office in a, in a uh, uh, not, not in a major command center anymore, but just in a little thing because they were still getting information from uh, uh, Voyager, uh, I believe Voyager 1, and uh, it had a technolo technological uh, capacity smaller than that of a modern cell phone. But they were still able to trace uh, material from it. I'll trace a couple of further parallels here. If I can find my... I said a few, uh, uh, a few minutes ago that there was a, a military or a um, nationalistic impulse behind explorations in all the stages of discovery. And if you set the first age of discovery against the second age of discovery, the third age of discovery in that aspect, Captain Cook uh, took along uh, a botanist, a rather famous man, to, when he went to Australia, he went to the South Seas. On a very tiny ship, he had to have the, this, this uh, scientist along with him. And of course, the crew resented it. I mean, space was valuable, and he was bringing aboard, you know, stinky samples of this and that, uh, and trying to preserve them. Uh, he was a sideshow on what was basically a military expedition, even though uh, Cook was originally sent on a, uh, a kind of astronomical uh, exposition of the uh, transit of Venus. <clears throat> Lewis and Clark embodied the scientific and the military in themselves. They were military officers holding the expedition together, but they were also the naturalists who were collecting the samples and recording the information about them. That's a different notion from having a separate botanist, separate naturalist, and, oh, excuse me, and a, a, a military commander in some kind of rivalry and uncomfortable relation to each other. Um, Jefferson was criticized for not having sent a proper scientist with, with the Lewis and Clark expedition, but he wisely chose to have them embodied in the same figures. With the uh, space probe, 
there was a rivalry from the beginning in NASA between people who wanted um, colonial settlement of new planets, Werner von Braun was among them, with people who wanted pure scientific information about what was, what was possible in outer space and what the planets were like, and other people who uh, just wanted the great achievement uh, uh, of, of that. Um, it, it became wholly scientific. It began with a military uh, component, but it became a wholly scientific project. Well, I said before that there was the parallel of hitting a barrier. In the first great age, Columbus went out to get to China. You remember where he hit? He came upon what he thought was China to the end of his life, but he'd actually come upon the American continents. And that was a barrier to getting to the, a, a faster trade route to China. To get there, you'd have to go all the way around, go down to the uh, Cape Horn until the, uh, the um, Panama Canal was built. So there was a search after search after search by explorers to find what was called a Northwest Passage, to find some way through the continent by a water route. It may become possible now with global warming to do that, through the Arctic. But Lewis and Clark were centuries later still trying to do that, to find a simple water route down the Ohio, up the Mississippi, up the Missouri, across, connect with the Columbia, and go down to cross the entire United States, or what would become the United States, the entire Northwest, the Northern continent by an easy, smooth water route. <clears throat> what the uh, Voyager came upon as its great barrier was the fact that this would have to be a once in a lifetime event, maybe a once and never more repeated event, partly because of the scientific principle on which it was built that this was a, an acceleration through the whole of the solar system that could only happen once every 176 years. And also by the fact that once it was done, it became clear that there was very little more support for a NASA exploration of this, of this dimension. Much could be done with the, uh, with the Hubble Space Telescope that had been developed in the meantime to look at these planets uh, with, with similar uh, results. <clears throat> this is Clark's map drawn in uh, f for the Lewis and Cl uh, publication of a, of a kind of abridged version of the Lewis and Clark journals in 1814. He actually kept a large copy of this map in his uh, uh, offices in St. Louis and added to it from time to time as other people came back from uh, the upper Missouri and brought in new details. Uh, if you look at it closely, you'll see two extraordinary features. One is how detailed the Rocky Mountains look. He put in that barrier to show just how uh, much of an obstacle to a simple um, Northwest Passage the American continent actually uh, presented. The other is rather harder to notice, but if you look over to the far left part of the screen, you'll see that there's a huge river that runs from about where Salt Lake City is and connects with the Columbia. That's the Willamette. <laughs> and Lewis and Clark thought that that would be a, a, you know, another great drainage that would, that would provide wealth and uh, they were thinking of wealth in terms of fur trapping, uh, great wealth to the, to the Americas if, if you could get ships around to pick up the furs from there and go directly to China. All three of these, uh, both of these uh, great explorations depended uh, in great part on chance, on good luck on uh, 
recovering from setbacks. There's a wonderful passage about discovery, scientific discovery of all kinds, uh, by Louis Pasteur. I want to quote it accurately. In the field of observation, chance favors the mind that is prepared. In the field of observation, chance favors the mind that is prepared, or in short terms, chance favors the prepared mind. You had to have some kinds of deep preparation to notice the little quirk or to accommodate yourself to the little quirk that presents itself. Lewis and Clark had that kind of resilience to say, okay, we've reached the great falls. They are great and they are falls. We can't go up them, we've got to go around them. But Lewis also had, <laughs> here's just one example. He took an observation of them and wrote back, knowing that his first audience would be Thomas Jefferson. Here are the most magnificent, spectacular scenery, except for perhaps one other, or one or two others in the American continent. He knew that Jefferson had already written about Niagara Falls, <laughs> and he knew that Jefferson considered the natural arch in Virginia to be one of the most spectacular pieces of American scenery, as indeed they were celebrated on maps and, and, and drawings and paintings of the, of the period. So he's saying, we didn't, we've got an obstacle here, let's make an advantage of it. We've got, <laughs> uh, Yellowstone Park may come out of that same kind of impulse. But there were further larger uh, dimensions of fortuitous circumstances blending into each other in both the Lewis and Clark and the uh, Voyager projects. In the Lewis and Clark project, you had, first of all, the mind of Thomas Jefferson. Before Lewis and Clark set out to do a, a thorough study of the American continent west of the Mississippi, Jefferson had written a, his one book, Notes on the State of Virginia. And by Virginia, which was the largest state and the most central of the original 13, he also meant America. He argued that uh, against European naturalists that America wasn't a country of stunted people and stunted animals. We had mastodons here, we had buffalo, we had, we had huge things over here, and our people were great. And he listed, uh, um, Benjamin Franklin is a good example to set against any genius of the, of the European uh, contemporary scene. Second, it just so happened that the plans for the Lewis and Clark expedition occurred simultaneously with the purchase of Louisiana. If it hadn't been for that, Lewis and Clark might well have been seen as intruders captured and sent to uh, prison in Spanish territory. Uh, that happened to other explorers who were sent further south at about the same time, further south along, uh, uh, further so uh, route to the south. Uh, then there was the good fortune that they ran into Sacagawea and her husband and had a way of trading with the Indians, found Indians who were willing to trade, willing to support them when they were absolutely stuck in the mountains on their return trip. At each stage, there were wonderful, there were astonishing setbacks which were somehow overcome by good fortune. The same thing happened with the Voyager expedition. <clears throat> First of all, there was a, a, a space race after Sputnik which helped promote uh, this kind of opportunity. <clears throat> then there were those technical achievements after the Second World War then the discovery of the ways of accelerating a rocket around the planets, and finally the, the discovery that you had just this one little window, one little window in our lifetime to make that trip. 
The final point I'll make, and then I'll take a few questions, is this. <clears throat> With each of these great ages of discovery, Americans and, well, people around the world who get, were involved in it, had to, had, had, had to uh, accommodate themselves to a new sense of space, a new sense of what uh, the dimensions of human life are. I, I, this is a, uh, not something that Pine develops. It's a kind of reflection I've made on my own, and I'm going to go into further reflections of my own in the second hour. Jefferson's generation grew up as British subjects. He thought of himself as British until the American Revolution came along. But after the revolution, he was part of a, a small country. He was part of Virginia. Then Jefferson is country Virginia, by acts of confederation, became a larger country, but still extended mainly along uh, the Atlantic seaboard. Beyond the Alleghenies, the British had declared was Indian territory into perpetuity. Well, you know what happened about that. People began to move across the Alleghenies and settle there and develop that part of the world. Their sense of America extended to the Mississippi River. And to be an American was to live in that much larger country surrounded by Spain to the west and the south, by uh, French holdings in the Caribbean and by Great Britain to the north. With the Louisiana Purchase and the exploration of Lewis and Clark, the country of America reached from coast to coast. Not necessarily as far south as California, that happened later. But you began to think of yourself as part of a North American continent which was exactly congruous with the uh, United States political system. In the uh, parallel case of the, of the uh, Voyager space probe, we've begun to think of ourselves in a new light. We've been not just as earthbound or even bound by travels to the moon, we've now sent a piece of ourselves, a little piece of our technology, beyond the solar system. Carl Sagan insisted that there should be something on that rocket to communicate with any people we might meet out there. You may know about this. He had a record, a golden 16 and a half RPM phonograph record placed on the rocket, uh, on the Voyager instrument part of it, so that if anybody encountered it, there were kinds of instructions about how to drop the needle and make it turn. <laughs> and it would pick up sounds of, 20th of the 20th century planet Earth from, I think it's Bach to uh, I, I'm not sure what, but sounds of birds, sounds of, of, of animals, voices in various languages in case we got there. But a little bit of us from America is still out there in outer space. Okay, that's about enough for now. Let's take a few questions if you'd like to. This is Charlene. I, is there a story behind the fact that the Voyager that left first was Voyager 2, and that the Voyager that went second was called Voyager 1? Um, 
Yes. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not really clear on that. I think there may have been, uh, I, I, there were originally three, and one of them really uh, it proved, uh, it, you know, when they did testing and everything on it, it just, it, they saved it. You know, they used to say if you had, uh, I won't go into the particular make of car, but they used to say that if you bought one, you should buy three, okay? <laughs> One for parts for the first one, you know, one for, one for driving, one for parts, and one for, for, for driving while the first one was in the shop using the second, you know. So there were, there were these two, two projects, uh, and, and they, I'm, I'm not exactly up on all the facts about how they went together. There's a lady down here. Okay, I'm um, next, right here. Okay. Um, I'd like to sort of compare these in my question, these two thoughts. The, when we crossed, Lewis and Clark and others, there were people here already, and we just sort of trounced over them and did our own thing and kind of wiped out those people. And then when we go into space, uh, we're biologically from Earth, and when we go, if we do find life, it's going to be probably hostile to us. And uh, our biology may not match their evolved bi biology. And what do you think of those two ideas? They're big ideas. <laughs> uh, and I, I'm serious about that. You, you need to take them uh, a little separately. Jefferson uh, it made a list of, uh, it goes to three or four pages of his instructions to Lewis about what he was to do. And he was curious to know about Indians. The encounter was not hostile. He was very explicit about this. Learn what you can about their ways. Take inventories of their languages. We've lost those. They, they were, there were printed forms on which to take down particular information about Indian languages. And uh, I have it somewhere here in my notes. Maybe it was for the second hour. <clears throat> Do not endanger yourselves, but treat the Indians with courtesy and respect as far as the circumstances of the case will allow. If they're, if they're hostile to you, you know, you've got to go on through, but it's more important to get you back safe than to have you make a conquest and, and lose your men in the process. Uh, they took a group of about 31 armed soldiers through this, uh, up, the Missouri, up the Missouri and across, and they wouldn't have survived if they hadn't. They did run into difficulties, that's true. But there was an impulse behind Jefferson's thinking Let's learn about them rather than dominate them. And the ex expectation was that this would remain Indian territory, that you wanted to have friendly intercourse with the Indians to enable passage to keep up an open commercial channel to the West, not for settlement. That wasn't the plan. Now, the second part of your question is, what if we meet uh, little green men in outer space? <laughs> And they're very different from us. They're a different kind of life form. They may not be able to communicate in anything like our languages. Uh, just uh, in the last couple of days, there was an article in uh, one of the newspapers about how NASA officials are concerned in the latest uh, attempts to go to Mars that they could find life and it could be terribly shocking uh, to the American conception of space if we find life on Mars. What would life be like? Would it have the same kind of meaning? Well, that's complicated by what we really mean by life. We think of it as, you know, meeting, lots of science fiction movies have it as meeting characters much like ourselves at similar stages of development, speaking languages, having a technology, and so on. It could be more like viruses. That's a form of life. Or it could be 
strange animals which have a different kind of DNA or something inscrutable that doesn't seem to be mineral, doesn't seem to be um, uh, use photosynthesis or oxygen, but in some ways is self-replicating and at a different stage of evolution than anything we've ever thought about. So it's complicated to even imagine sometimes what such an encounter would involve. Hi, this is Gwen Ellen. I'm curious, I know Jefferson traveled east to France enough. Do I'm you sorry? know Jefferson traveled to France? Yes. Do you know how far west into what's the United States now, how far west he ever traveled? Not far, not far. No, he did not cross the Alleghenies. I think, first of all, we're out of time, basically. It's time for the break. Um, so hold your questions for the second half, all right? Thank you. Could, could you, could I ask, uh, could I add just one more thing? Uh, if you really like to learn more about the Lewis and Clark expedition, and particularly as it relates to Oregon, uh, I have brought with me some materials from what's called the Lewis and Clark Trail Heritage Foundation. Uh, there's a main office in Great Falls. It's a national organization. Every year they run a conference at a different part of the Lewis and Clark Trail and they are a hoot. <laughs> Local experts take people out to the sites there and arrange special events for them. Just this past year, they had a wonderful meeting up in Astoria. They go from one part of the west to one part of the east. Next year, it'll be in St. Louis. And uh, the, it's an, they produce a uh, quarterly newsletter with articles of great interest uh, written by people who know what they're talking about. So I'll put out some information for, about that. And along with it, the people in Great Falls sent me National Park Service brochures about the Lewis and Clark Trail. I'll set those out here as well. Here in Oregon, we have a chapter of the Lewis and Clark Trail Heritage Foundation. And I have some membership forms for that, too. And we arrange local events. Um, I can give you a couple of examples. We got a special rate to go on the Portland Spirit on a one-day special trip. Uh, it was open to the public, but we got a special rate. Uh, with Lewis and Clark members who could provide uh, guidance as we went on the Portland Spirit from Portland down to Astoria. Another time we went from Portland up to uh, Cascade Locks uh, with expert descriptions of what was happening on the, on the shoreline all the way. Uh, last, uh, a few months ago, uh, we got a backstage tour of the holdings of the Oregon Historical Society in their secret, hidden, not to be disclosed location of all their, uh, of their main warehouse. It's events like that. Uh, and sometimes they're just uh, uh, an annual dinner or things like that in which you have another expert speaker. So I'll put these materials out here on the uh, steps. What I tried to do in the first hour was uh, largely expository, giving you the sense of what uh, happened in Lewis and Clark and what happened in the Voyager space probe. And that's maybe as technical as I can get. Uh, that's the limitations of uh, my information about uh, those for now. What we'll do in the second hour is deal with what I used to tell my classes they were really getting, some Furt Wanglerology. Um, <laughs> These are some reflections that I've had and that this talk has given me an opportunity to kind of put in a in better order. I said that I would, in my, uh, the description that you all read with avidity about uh, my coming talk, uh, <laughs> that I would talk about Oregon's place in American geography, successive conquests of space by American inventions, and paradoxical results of technological <laughs> conquests. So I'm going to do as advertised. I'm going to just go over those three topics. I put up again a, a map 
and I won't lean into it, I'll keep near the microphone, trusting that you will follow where I go. To, to suggest how Oregon has a very peculiar relation to the Lewis and Clark expedition. Uh, it's very large out here. It, as you know, there are Lewis and Clark signposts uh, along the Columbia and along other parts of uh, Oregon and Washington um, to uh, point out that, that, that these were our pioneers. These were the great founders, in a way, of what we think of as the Pacific Northwest. If you go to other places along the route to retrace the whole step, that's why I put up the map, uh, <clears throat> you'll, you, you'll see that the Lewis and Clark are memorialized, but always with something else uh, at hand. In the west uh, entrance of Monticello, there are relics of the Lewis and Clark expedition, antlers and things like that, that they brought back, that Lewis brought back. Uh, but of course, that's a, Monticello has a whole lot of other history to it, and it's in a nest of uh, famous homes uh, of American presidents. Washington, Madison, uh, Monroe, and Jefferson are all in close proximity to each other, and Lewis and Clark uh, have a little monument in, in, in uh, Charlottesville, but they're secondary to the presidential pride of the state of Virginia. If you go to Philadelphia, Lewis and Clark each have portraits hanging in Independence Hall. But Independence Hall is Independence Hall, where the Second Declaration of Independence was uh, created and where uh, the Constitution of the United States came to have its form. And the great heroes there are not just the presidents, but uh, Philadelphia is the great city of Benjamin Franklin and uh, of the great debates about what America could be between uh, uh, James Madison and Alexander Hamilton. I believe there's been a recent play about him. <laughs> if you move across to uh, St. Louis, there's the Gateway Arch and a national park uh, uh, development there with a wonderful exhib exhibit of Lewis and Clark and Lewis and Clark artifacts. But St. Louis is also uh, that the gateway to the entire West, and it is a port on the Mississippi, not on the Missouri. It's on the great north-south north axis of middle America. Uh, I had this brought home to me a few years ago when I made a trip across the country and stopped in St. Louis and started to look for Lewis and Clark sites. And I went out to St. Charles and you can still see the Missouri River there um, in somewhat of a pristine state. And I looked across at this river and tried to imagine uh, Lewis and Clark right there. But at the edge of my site, there was a movie company and I wondered, what are they doing down on a wharf? Well, they were about to film Huckleberry Finn. <laughs> That's Mark Twain country. <clears throat> if you move further west, in the early, in the early 20th century, uh, the governor of Montana got Charlie Russell to create a painting to hang behind the speaker's chair in the Capitol. They specifically wanted Lewis and Clark meeting with the Flathead Indians. Look carefully. Where are Lewis and Clark? <laughs> Way back there. This is Charlie Russell's Montana. Rawhide, Indians on horseback. That's, Lewis and Clark are part of the show, but incidental players passing through. <clears throat> Here we are in Oregon's capital. Lewis and Clark at the Falls of the Columbia, 
meeting with Indians, meeting with Indians who were shrewd capitalists, who were drying salmon, who were uh, building wonderful canoes, who were a new civilization and uh, didn't want to trade their goods for less than they could get for them. Lewis and Clark feature big here. There, if you go into the Capitol Rotunda, you know that there are four great panels there. <clears throat> Robert Gray, aboard his uh, ship, the, the Columbia Rita Viva, that gave the river its name. Uh, Lewis and Clark, who came overland. Uh, let me think. The, the missionaries who came to Fort Vancouver and then the pioneers who came over the Oregon Trail. But these are the, 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 the figures who gave us the state of Oregon. And there's much more in, in Oregon. You know, in the seal of the Oregon Historical Society is the uh, Jefferson Peace Medal that, that Lewis and Clark carried and, and gave to uh, designated chiefs as a, as, a, as a token of their having visited here and having made good relations with the Indians. Oregon Trail, and the, uh, or particularly the Lewis and Clark Trail, is not just a way west into Oregon. It's also a way back from Oregon to the earliest part of the American experience. We have our own founding father, Thomas Jefferson. I'll say quite a few things about Jefferson because he's such a cap capacious uh, figure in, in, a, in American exploration history. <clears throat> he had what, what I call a polymath mind. He was interested in all kinds of things. You know, there's that uh, famous anecdote about uh, uh, John Kennedy hosting a dinner for Nobel laureates at the White House. And he began, I mean, the speechwriters gave it to him, of course, but he began by saying, there is the greatest collection of human intellect in this room tonight since Thomas Jefferson dined here alone. <laughs> um, he was interested, he kept, he kept close observations of nature and of, of uh, meteorological and other phenomena he explored, he, he, uh, his own state. He kept statistics about crops. He was interested in new discoveries. He read widely. He was one of the best informed people about the actual uh, depths of what could be known about the American continent. He collected maps. Um, and so he was a, 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 a figure who could see not just into the past, but into the future of what America might be. And we're the heirs of that. We're here in part because of his capacity to move from the generation of the revolutionaries to the generation of Lewis and Clark and see beyond that to what their exploration was making possible. You know, in uh, Southern Oregon, there's a putative state of Jefferson. You know, there's a, the state of Jefferson. There's a, uh, an article a few years ago in the Oregon Historical Quarterly about how that has been uh, a kind of political effort in in history, but it's now kind of a uh, honorific title to create an, its own region. But Jefferson imagined a country of yeoman farmers. Uh, uh, he never used the word yeoman farmers, but that's how it's often described. People who lived on the land, had their own uh, small land holdings, and lived by subsistence in that way. Um, maybe trading a few goods, but not in a large uh, market economy. That's what happened here in the Malamet Valley. People came out and staked their claims to Oregon to nation land claims of uh, 
uh, we talked about that last week with uh, Tom Marsh's speech about how people came, got their little claims, moved out, each separate from another, but uh, living pretty independently. And he thought that was the root of democracy, uh, Jefferson did, to have uh, small, small land holdings of, of people living on the land that way. And that, uh, the Willamette Valley turned out to be a kind of uh, paradisal fulfillment of the Jeffersonian ideal. Finally, the Columbia, which Lewis and Clark explored, is still a lifeline between the inland empire and the uh, trading of the, uh, of the North Pacific. Now the whole history of America can be traced through interrelated uh, geographic and technological developments. If you think about it, each step of uh, American history has <clears throat> in some ways been an attempt to overcome the vastness and the barriers of the American continent. At the same time that the Founding Fathers were meeting in Philadelphia in 1787, some uh, enterprising entrepreneurs were demonstrating on the Schuylkill River mechanical boats that could run on something besides human power. And within a few years after Lewis and Clark, in 1817, Fulton was running a steamboat from New York City to Albany. Within a few years after that, there were steamboats on the Ohio from, from uh, let me see here, from Louisville to New Orleans and back. Stephen Long's expedition to the Rocky Mountains up the Platte took place in 1819 on a steamboat. By the end of the Madison administration, right after Jefferson's, the historian Henry Adams said Americans had found a new invention. I'll give you his exact words. By 1817, besides clearing away every obstacle to the occupation and development of their continent, as far as the Mississippi River, the American people had created the steamboat, the most efficient instrument yet conceived for developing such a country. The continent lay before them like an uncovered ore bed. <clears throat> Moving up, not just exploring, but taking a new technology to that exploration, using rivers to unfold the riches of the entire continent. Now, of course, rivers are chancy things. They flood. They have falls. They have snags. I once, when doing some research on Mark Twain's life in the Mississippi, in which he talks about being a river pilot on the Mississippi in his early years, most of those steamboats on the Mississippi blew up. There was the hazard of, of the technology itself for getting up the rivers. So American inventiveness moved a different way. It laid down rail lines. Rail lines didn't have that problem. They often followed a river route to keep it rather level. But even so, they could overcome barriers. <clears throat> In 1853, an explorer came west. He was a retired military officer, freshly retired, West Point graduate, uh, military engineer. He was to be the new governor of Washington Territory, the chief of the North Northern Railroad Exploration Party to find a route for a railroad across the northern tier, and the superintendent of Indian Affairs for Washington Territory. His name is Isaac I. Stevens, first governor of Washington. Doesn't that sound familiar? Military? Explorer, 
<laughs> engaging with the Indians, he understood himself to be walking exactly in the footsteps of Lewis and Clark. But by 1869, there was a transcontinental railroad. What works into that uh, history is another thread that you might want to ponder. Stevens was exploring a northern route to the Pacific. He was reporting to Jefferson Davis, who wanted a southern route to the Pacific. Along the edges of Mexican holdings, Spanish holdings, Mexican holdings, to reach California. Why? Because he wanted to make slavery come west. Northern people wanted slavery excluded from the West, and thereby hangs a very bitter tale. The West, once explored, was the whole point of controversy. If you think about the rivalries between the North and the South, who was going to have dominance over that? Slave states or free states? America is free, America is as holding on to slaves. By the early 20th century, there were automobiles. By the 1950s, there were interstate highways. Remember that whole big project of Eisenhower's to build the big interstates? In a way, that's an American achievement over time and space. An achievement in a lot of other ways, too, for teenagers to get away from their parents. But if you think about it, and advertising does, uh, does drive this point home again and again, the keys to your car are the keys to America. Get in your car and go anywhere, anywhere on the continent. Your sense of space is changed by the fact of private ownership and management of the private automobile. You know, the, what I'm saying about advertisement, you watch advertisement, where do they show you cars going? Well, they show you climbing Pikes Peak or, or going to the edges of the, of the continent or going into great wilderness all by yourself as though there were no road there. But that's, that's a, a re, reconfiguration of how you see space around you is that you can get in your car and go anywhere. You belong in America. Finally, with aircraft, we can go right over the mountains, right above them. You know, that's a, 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 a I went back to my high school, uh, it was my high school paper, something about, yes, I, I had, a, there was a clipping that I had from the front page of a Seattle Times uh, about the time that I was graduating from high school. I can't remember the exact reason for that. But it was introducing direct flights from Seattle to New York. That was a novelty in 1960 that we could do that. Again, changed your sense that you didn't have to hop from here to hop to there to hop to somewhere else to get where you wanted to go. You could understand that you could get in one hop over the Rockies and over the whole continent as recently as 50 years ago. Along with these developments of technological transportation changes, we've had technological communication changes from the telegraph to the telephone to the films to the radio to television to, well, the instantaneous communication that every kid carries in his pocket these days, bringing us closer and closer and closer overcoming the, spa the space and time differences that hold us apart. And we have to live differently from our previous generations with that sense of who we are and where we fit into time and space. The Voyager uh, projects could send back their signals, but they could only do that at the uh, speed of light. 
which meant that in some cases, the signal from f billions of miles away could not get here for hours or even the delay of a day. They had to be almost uh, semi-autonomous because sometimes the, the, the instructions that were coming from the Earth would take that long to get back as a reply. But that's nothing like Jefferson giving uh, Meriwether Lewis's instructions and then not hearing from him again for three years. <laughs> Think how far we've come. What an acceleration in our sense of space and time the American experience has created. That we've moved from uh, those long delays of communication in space and time to these instantaneous uh, capacities of communication and these very long distance uh, capacities of our transportation systems. And think for a moment of, you know, what your parents and mine and grandparents, how far they could travel in the world compared to where we travel now. I mean, obviously, some of, all of us have had an ancestor who came across the Atlantic. <clears throat> but, uh, well, I have a granddaughter, for example, who by the time she was 12 had been uh, in Africa and in India. Incredible. The third point I wanted to make was about the paradoxical results of these technological conquests of space and time. The very word conquest is uh, problematic, isn't it? We were talking about that a few minutes ago with your question about engagement with the Indians. We've engaged with other peoples. We haven't just gone into vacant space, though that's sometimes been the mythology that we, we took over empty spaces where the Indians uh, just gave up and went away. They didn't, of course. A century ago, the winning of the West could be a matter of uh, patriotic pride. Now you say that winning of the West and it catches in our throats a bit. Um, we know that native peoples have been cruelly displaced and uh, savaged by uh, effort to dominate new territory. And I talked a bit before about how the Lewis and Clark story can remind us of an alternative invasion, <clears throat> of an alternative. Yes, invasion, but also an exchange. In order to come west, Lewis and Clark had to learn from the Indians. They had to learn from the Indians how to dress, how to eat, local, uh, uh, live off the land, how to practice some kinds of uh, remedies for the uh, irritations and diseases they ran into. And they had to depend on Indian hospitality, as they well knew. <clears throat> In return, Lewis and Clark had to promise uh, that they would live, that the Indians would live better than they had under Spanish domination or under French domination or under the rival uh, explorations of uh, the British from the north. And here's another important lesson we've learned by studying Lewis and Clark and this whole project of domination over the West. Excuse me. It is that you don't look at Indians as one in just a snapshot. There's a way that we've romanticized Indians. Um, well, let me go to the, uh, let me go back a step. There's a good example of it. But that's a snapshot of Indians on horseback. Horses came because of exploration. They're not indigenous to America. The horses came with the Spanish. And eventually, maybe in the late 17th century, arrived in this part of the world. And the Indians who were here, the native peoples who were here, ingeniously adapted to riding them, 
using them in hunting, uh, breeding them, so that by the time Lewis and Clark arrived, they were able to rely on Indian horse breeders to give them, to trade with them and give them horses that they could use. Lewis and Clark often admired the excellent horses they saw in the northern uh, Montana, that they were uh, an achievement of Indians in transition. And Indians in transition have gone on to this day. They, they've adapted uh, brilliantly in many cases to the, to the uh, invasion of people from another culture. Nevertheless, our, our, this is, I guess, a further point I want to make. Our rapid technological developments have foreshortened time in a peculiar way. By reversing long, the long spread and diversion, diffusion of native peoples to infiltrate all the continents. By this I mean that it took thousands and tens of thousands of years for the human species to spread out over all the continents that we know of, except of course Antarctica. And in doing that, our, our studies of DNA tell us that they, that they developed in different ways. They developed different skin colors. They developed uh, different skeletal patterns. They developed, of course, different languages. And by the uh, end of, say, the 16th century, there were uh, peoples who were living far removed from each other who could not conceive of each other, who could not understand how, how very different they were. Anthropologists have still run into, in the 19th and 20th centuries, people that seemed to them very strange. But with, this, with the technological developments that we've had, we're now bringing all those together, sometimes with violence, sometimes right up close with invasions uh, coming the other way, not just going out to dominate, but having people from the far reaches of the world return to the main metropolises of what we call the civilized world. And we're now living cheek by jowl with people who have come from Africa, from the Caribbean, from Asia, from uh, South America, from all over the world who are mingling together after thousands and thousands of years of separation. That's a jolt. We're meeting, as this Pogo used to say, we have met the enemy and he is us. <laughs> the Americas are obviously, an ex uh, 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 particularly North America under the United States, has been along a meeting ground for the entire world to come together again. At this point, you might say there's a crisis I'd like to go back to one further uh, step here. Um, this is kind of speculative on my part. Uh, fruit anglerology with a vengeance. But you remember the Pyle uh, remark that uh, scientific expl or, or exploration was driven by three great, great impulses. One was domination, one was scientific quest for knowledge. And the third was a pressure on us from the inception of our uh, landing in America to keep going, just something built into our DNA as Americans. And these are both American projects, the conquest of uh, the, uh, the Lewis and Clark expedition and the, and the Voyager expedition. There's something in the, in the cultural, if not the genetic, makeup of Americans that wants to go further and further and further. There's also, perhaps, something in the American makeup that has a different impulse, a contrary, not a contrary, but a complementary impulse. And that is also Jeffersonian. If you think, what does American, what do Americans believe? What do Americans stand for? What do Americans have as a distinguishing characteristic? Uh, 
I would say it comes back to the, ver the, the words of the Declaration of Independence. <clears throat> we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. You scratch an American, he bleeds and he shouts, I have my rights. I have my rights. Rights, human rights, not always specified, worked out in the, in the Bill of Rights later in the Constitution, but always with the opening. Among these, not these are the only ones, among these are life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. And the stages of American history have again and again been for an expansion of American rights, to extend it to uh, people without a poll tax, to extend it to people who had a previous condition of slavery, to extend it from uh, male suffrage alone to women, to people 18 and older rather than 21 and older. Again and again in American history, the pressure has been extend human rights. So parallel with extending, expanding the sphere of time and space, there's been an American pressure to extend and enlarge human freedom. Both have their source, or at least their articulation, and pretty grand articulation in the mind of Jefferson. And the Lewis and Clark expedition is one branch of that development out of Jefferson's imagination. Scientific discovery leading to the Voyager expedition is another. And a whole lot of history in America has been that expansion of human rights, extension of human rights, redefinition of human rights from generation to generation, again, from the mind of Jefferson on. I'd be glad to take more questions. I think my question isn't as germane in the second second half of your lecture, but uh, you're saying the Jeffersonian um, belief that uh, Americans are bigger and can expand and are better and growing and the motivation to expand. I know that either um, Lewis or Clark committed suicide when they got back. Could you address that and why? Was it Lewis who went back to Washington? Or was it Clark, probably, who went back to St. Louis and his brother? Okay. Uh, uh, why, with this expansive, hopeful, can, you know, surpass any barrier? Why the suicide? Wow. <laughs> That's a can of worms, okay? That's a very controversial issue still. Was Lewis murdered or did he commit suicide? If he committed suicide, why did he do it? If he was murdered, who were the conspirators? Lewis was rewarded by being appointed the governor of Louisiana, ter of uh, Missouri Territory, which was a, a whole, it was all of the West that wasn't in Louisiana and that big tract. So he was based in St. Louis. Uh, he had a complicated story related to the expedition. He had brought that back with him on his return trip a chief from the Mandan area to go to Washington, D.C. and meet the president. And he conducted him back. Then he tried to get him back to his own people, and they were stymied. They were blocked by uh, Sioux Indians 
uh, further up the Missouri. And he had to go to a great deal of trouble and expenditure to get him back safely. But his warrants, uh, Lewis's warrants to pay for that were not being honored by the Treasury Department. Jefferson had gone out of office, Madison had come in, there were new people there. He had political enemies in his own administration in, in, in his territory. So he was heading back to Washington to present his case. That sounds very purposeful. Not like a man who's deranged, not like a man who no, doesn't know what he's doing. But on the Natchez Trace at a remote inn, he died of gunshot wounds. And there were people who knew him at the time, who were near him, who had detained him at a fort saying he was deranged, not uh, himself as part of that trip. So there's all sorts of controversy about whether he really was deranged, whether those witnesses can be trusted, whether he was under the influence of alcohol, whether he was under the influence of malaria, whether he was in under the influence of a venereal disease he had picked up among the Indians of the West, whether he was a, a manic depressive uh, who had uh, suddenly snapped uh, in, under the uh, pressures of his time. People have, have uh, urged all those theories about why he might have committed suicide. Or there were people who wanted to separate the West and or, or organize a new government in the West away from the uh, uh, federal government in Washington, D.C. Uh, Aaron Burr had been involved in such an, a notion. A military commander named Wilkinson had been involved in, in accepting bribes from the Spanish. It, it, there were strange things going on in the, in the machinations of the West. Was somebody out to kill Lewis and uh, make a, 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 a first step toward some kind of conspiratorial uh, development? We don't know. But it goes back and forth because Lewis, to many, represents a hero. Why should such a good man die young? The future was before him. And if you compare it to Clark, who succeeded him as governor, Governor uh, Clark had a very successful career for many, many years as governor of the Louisiana Territory, of uh, the Missouri Territory, excuse me. Another question. Over here. Uh, good morning, my name is Bob, and thank you very much. It's been a very interesting presentation. I want to go back to your statement about um, American tendencies to expand and the American westward geographical expansion and then the expansion of rights. I don't know how to the best phrase this question, but I'll start this way. Are you really saying that that's a, an essential quality of Americans or are you just saying that's a tendency that we see in American history which might be explained by historical events, social and economic circumstances. Because I think with respect to uh, rights, there are historical circumstances you can point to that really, without which the, the, those rights would not have been expanded. Uh, women got the right to vote in, in large part because they protested and asked for it, pushed for it, and eventually got it. And then with respect to movement into the Willamette Valley, I, I studied a, a monograph that comes from the University of Washington. And to my surprise, I, the, the story I had always heard was, oh, they went westward because of opportunity, for, you know, free land. And there was free land. But a lot of them were leaving land in the uh, Ohio River Valley and the Missouri, uh, lower Missouri and central uh, United States at the time because of disease. Malaria, smallpox, yellow fever, and cholera were killing them. And they were looking for a healthier environment. So isn't that an, another explanation for why Americans, which have plenty of arable land in the middle of the country, would go clear across the Rockies and die in significant numbers to find the Willamette Valley? Those are good points. Uh, I was really starting with Pine's suggestion that there was something built into the American character. He, he, he started with that idea of a, of a drive, and he, he put it to, 
behind the, the Voyager project as well as the uh, American expansion across the con continent. So that was, that was his point, and I followed up on it, I, to be sure. There are, other, there are other explanations. One of the things that, that any historian uh, nowadays does is, is hold the thought there could be another explanation. <laughs> I mean, it's always a matter of, of looking at evidence that's sometimes conflicting, sometimes contrary, and there, there are seasons in uh, interpretations of anything. You find that, that uh, a, a, a history written during the 60s or 70s has in it a, uh, an edge of awareness of Vietnam. A uh, history written in the 1890s has an awareness of the Civil War looming behind it. Uh, maybe uh, uh, Pine and maybe me uh, are looking at uh, uh, the development of American history in light of the fact that along came the Voyager after it. Uh, and we're trying to find a common thread and you can warp your interpretation as a result of that. That's a good point. Alice is Jim. I'm still trying to get in my head the kind of instructions they might have left for that little 16 and a half RPM disc. I'm thinking I can't get IKEA out of my head. Did they have little IKEA type illustrations? Do you think? Or I, I'm sorry, Jim. I couldn't quite hear you clearly. <laughs> well, well, Why? Because I'm not very clear. Um, the, you're talking about Lewis and Clark. No, I'm jumping to ex space exploration to the okay. first half, I'm okay. sorry to say. Although I have plenty of thoughts about equality and whether it's a typical American quality. I think every country uses that to keep their people in tow, more or less. And also the, the word equality has different meanings. If I think of égalité or... Um, the Russian concept of it, I, I remember one time when I was a student in the Soviet Union, um, the people would tell me, these are babushkas, older people, why do you stay, I'd, I'd ask them, and, and they said, because here we're free. And they meant it. They weren't using propaganda. They truly thought that in their country, they were free. And in America, it was a very dangerous country, again, because of the propaganda that they got. Right. So. Well, you don't confuse two things, freedom and equality. Those are different things. Um, and uh, uh, there's a strain in American history all along to reconcile them. Some people say that, you know, the emphasis really must be on freedom. That, a, that a universal equality is, a, is an impossible pipe dream and that... Uh, uh, trying to extend equality to everyone is a way of limiting some people's freedom for the benefit of others, really, at, at base. There are others who uh, stress the point that, uh, no, you can't really have freedom until you have a recognition of some essential equality in human beings, certainly equality before the law. Uh, so there's, there's that. Then the second thing is, well, where does the notion come from that you extol freedom or equality? And it comes from partly and very largely the American achievement of a government that um, has those things enshrined as its basic principles. Lincoln referred to that again and again in the Civil War. He came, you know, you know in the terms of the Gettysburg Address, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated, can long endure. That's, that's what it mattered to him, that if we don't have equality, we can't have the, the kind of freedom that was posited, posited it. What's the word I want? Promoted <laughs> by the founders in the Declaration. He came back, came back to that again and again. So even your Russians may be saying, well, we want freedom, but they came out of a feudal society, which was certainly unequal in the times of the czars, as well as in the, uh, under a uh, totalitarian regime. I put this last picture up because it's a, a, uh, a shot of the earth from uh, the Voyagers. 
uh, Voyager 1, I believe. And uh, it has a couple of things worth noticing about it. One is it's a blue dot. Other planets aren't that way. Other planets do not have oxygen. And Pine, who has studied fire, indicates that you can't have fire on the other planets. You can have explosions, you can have a volcanic heat, but without oxygen and hydrocarbons, you can't have fire. Therefore, you can't have life. Life produces oxygen. Life produces hydrocarbons. Unless there's life, you can't have a blue atmosphere. Second is, that this is a very American picture, <laughs> right? It focuses in just at a time that North America is coming into view. There's a very cloudy Northwest. How about that for a Lewis eclipse? <laughs> and if you also think about it, that's what you got from Lewis and Clark a view of the entire continent, a revolutionary view from outer space of what the whole of America might look like. Is that a good point on which to add? <laughs> Thank you so much for that lesson in American history, but also in making us think about American history. Please.